Welcome to Prepare the Way, a show dedicated to all matters related to evangelization. I am your host, Martha Fernandez Sardina, Director of the Office for Evangelization of the Archdiocese of San Antonio and Director of Prepare the Way Enterprises, a ministry dedicated to helping Catholics become everyday evangelized evangelizers. And that is our call, to be everyday evangelizers. I had the opportunity to interview a number of people at the New Evangelization of America conference in Dallas, Texas, and today I present to you an interview I had with Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, the Cardinal Archbishop of the Diocese Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. And after that, we will listen to and converse with Roy Abraham Varghese from the Diocese of Dallas. The Cardinal speaks to us about the divine courtesy that we must have when we evangelize about the fact that we need to abide in Jesus and how important authenticity is for our evangelization efforts. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's Good to be to here. Have, it's great to have in the uh, state of Texas a cardinal, too. Uh, that's what the Baptists are saying even in <laughs> Houston, that they don't know what it means, but uh, if it sounds good for Texas, it's okay by them. So I'm, I'm in agreement with them on that. Sounds good to us. Tell us your thoughts on the new evangelization, the progress that uh, we've made over the last 10, 20, 30 years. What are some things that kind of stand out in your mind as the fruits of the new evangelization? One of the fruits uh, that I see, uh, being new to the South, uh, the South has been, or at least where I'm from now in Houston, uh, an intense area of what they like to call the Bible Belt. And uh, what I've discovered in the new evangelization, where people have more and more internalized their Catholic faith as a personal uh, experience also of, of the revealed truth of Jesus and intimacy with him in prayer, uh, there's a certain amount of um, confidence that they have and an ability and willingness to share their faith uh, a willingness in the past that Catholics would do, but we always felt as though we were uh, using that same word. We were being too overly evangelical. Mm. But now we're understanding that to be evangelical, that is, to give a, a sense of your faith, a witness to it, is good. Yes. And in fact, where the, the institutional components of the church and the faith of the whole church, that kind of objectivity, moves with your own personal appropriation of that, uh, that's a very sure firepower way uh, uh, to build up the church and the faith. And that's great because uh, oftentimes people will leave the Catholic Church because they say, I, I never encountered Christ in it, as if objectively he were not in it, but it's great to hear you say that in fact people are more appropriating the faith better. As we see it, at least those who, uh, who have come to a, a deeper resonance of their faith, I notice it a lot in our young people. Uh, for instance, uh, they're very devoted to the Eucharist, very devoted to adoration. But they, they sense they need this intimacy with Jesus so they can be effective uh, witnesses of the faith and, and, and their own sense of themselves. Yeah. I think that's important. It's, uh, the young people are, are a population that I think sometimes can be and has been neglected, and, and so it is a great thing that more and more are coming forward, and they themselves becoming evangelizers. Have you seen that? Right, because their own credible witness to living their faith, uh, they're not afraid to say, come and see, mm -hmm. as Jesus said to the uh, disciples at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, come and see abide with me. They're not afraid to do that. And I find that um, a, a good inspiration from uh, numbers of our young people who recognize in Christ Jesus and in their Catholic faith uh, something that's worth sharing. sharing. I've heard you speak on credibility as a key component of the new evangelization, the credibility of witness. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, like Jesus, who came forth and uh, began to evangelize, he's the best evangelizer we have. By far. Uh, by far. Uh, but he was a credible witness because his life spoke what he said, and what he said was enacted in his, in his life. We're speaking here of his human nature. You can say, yes, but he was a son of God. That's correct. Had a and he extra gives, help. Right. He <laughs> gives to those who come to him that same sense of what I'd like to call coherence mm. between what you say and the way you engage the world, your family, yourself, and that becomes credible. Someone's gonna say, uh, why, do you, 
what are you about? And they're not going to do it negatively. They're going to say there's something here that I'd like to know about. So that's what I mean by credibility. I think that the witness of the church, objectively, you know, what we give is credible. What makes it incredible is Christians live in such a way as that they don't value, appreciate, or internalize uh, the gifts God gives to his church. So you see that some people will reject the message, not so much because of the message, but because of the messengers, meaning ourselves? Sure, the ourselves. messengers are less than credible. Mm. And that goes across the boards. I mean, I'm not speaking there. We say, well, you're talking about your young people or family. No, the same can be true with priests, deacons, catechists, those even who are more officially engaged in uh, spreading the work of the church. They can be less than credible. I have two responses. First of all, they're not the only ones that are supposed to be spreading the message. Secondly, yes, where they are not credible, then it makes it rough for uh, God's people. But God's people frequently are very, very credible about the faith and should not be afraid to share it. I do not mean uh, evangelize in the sense of uh, domineering, mm. manipulating mm. people, but rather come and see. And when they recognize in you this sense of love for Christ, love for the faith, the Eucharist, the church, uh, they look and say, well, look at the way they live. That, that person, you know, despite all the troubles in their life, they have an outlook that is very hopeful. And uh, I think that's a clue. Yeah, Pope Paul VI in Evangelii Nunciandi on evangelization in the modern world speaks so beautifully about that, uh, raising questions with that silent proclamation of a well-lived life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've heard you talk about the fact that uh, there's a certain th thing you've called divine courtesy. And I bring this up because a lot of those of us who are involved in evangelization have such a zeal and a passion for Jesus that we may sometimes fail to be courteous toward others, and yet you see that in the life of Christ you were sharing. We may come across as arrogant, mm. is what can happen. The zeal is construed as arrogance or domination. Uh, one of the things we notice in Christ Jesus is the, is the patient, earthy but patient way he treats the Twelve, uh, who are frequently clueless uh, during the public yes. life. Uh, but that's a giveaway too, even for the apostles who were living with Jesus, abiding with him. Uh, the cross was a real obstacle, and Jesus patiently puts up with them, teaches them, instructs them, and uh, he does not grow overly angry. There's a beautiful scene where the apostles in Mark's gospel, it's around Mark chapter 10, are describing who's the greatest on the way back from something. Mm. And it's, it, you say, after all this time, and what does Jesus do to instruct them? He finds a little child, uh -huh. and he places the little child in the midst. He says, that's the kingdom of God, which they're shocked. But it's a beautiful, instructive, he corrects them, does it gently. gently. And to my mind, that's the divine courtesy. courtesy. Uh, the, the, we see that beautifully in that passage where he's being pressed from every side, and he asks that question, who touched me? Who and, touched me, And yes. they respond in a rather odd well, way. Well, in Mark's gospel particularly, Matthew and Luke tone it down. But in Mark's gospel, the, the basic response is, who touched me? Look around and see the crowd, can't you tell? There are all kinds of people around. And Jesus does not grow upset. Instead, he keeps looking for the woman. Yeah, and he's very courteous him. toward them. And, and I courteous think it, towards them all the time. Far more courteous, let's be frank, than we would ever be. That's correct. And I think he, he remains in every regard our model for what it means to evangelize. Now, to develop that Christ-like attitude, we must abide with him. What does that mean? Because John especially talks a lot about that in his gospel, to abide with Jesus. What is that about? If we were to look at the Last Supper sermon in the Gospel of St. John, I never tire of reminding people the Last Supper scene in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is anywhere from 30 to 60 verses. I mean, it's significant. Mm -hmm. But in John's Gospel, the Last Supper scene is five chapters. Wow. That's a dead giveaway. Yeah. yeah. How significant. This night before uh, he died, before he was lifted up to the Father, that Jesus shares his uh, last will and testament with his friends. And the word abiding is frequently there. The most powerful image of that is, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you don't abide and remain in me, you're like a dead branch. You won't bear any fruit. What does that mean? Um, pretty frankly, it means if you don't waste some time with the Lord Jesus, 
you're not going to abide with him. We call that prayer. Yeah. So you need time to pray, to let the word of God in the scriptures, or perhaps even through the rosary. There are a variety of ways in which that can happen, that you allow yourself to remain with him. When you do, Jesus does speak. That's the real mm. issue. We would prefer that we speak. <laughs> And he listens, yeah. uh, but uh, he will listen, speak. Listen, Lord, thy servant is speaking. I have, yes, I have a plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say that sometimes. <laughs> I have a plan for you, Jesus. It is so good, you can't believe how good it is. But that's not always abiding. Uh, prayer means an, a, a, list, a listening posture as well as an asking one. I have no trouble with intercessory petitionary prayer. I don't even have any trouble when people say, I've got a good idea, Jesus. What I just like is when you finished, if you just be silent yeah. and let Jesus move in you. If there is not friendship with Jesus and intimacy in prayer, then how are you gonna know how he deals with his Father? Mm -hmm. And then how are they gonna come to you and abide with you more deeply? That's what I mean. We have to learn a spirit of prayer, listening. Uh, our culture is pretty much invested in noise. So this is real countercultural to do that. Mm -hmm. And yet I find, maybe because so many young people are so filled with noise all the time, they appreciate and appropriate the times of silence with the Lord. It's probably why so many of them find such refuge in uh, Eucharistic adoration. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully said because uh, you said, if we don't waste time with the Lord, and immediately the thought came to my mind, you are wasting your time. If we don't waste time, if we don't spend time with Jesus, which sometimes we consider a waste, then any every any and every other effort we, we are making it would be really a waste Will of time. Will be a waste. Yeah. You may be successful in some levels, uh, but what you'll discover after a while is that you're a mess. Mm. And when you abide in the Lord Jesus, he doesn't solve any problem. What he does is he helps you through them. When you abide with Jesus, you get a sense of confidence in his love. And isn't that what we're about? That's that, the we're, that he's the gift of love to us. That's what helps you become more of a gift for others. It's not magic, but it also requires discipline and purity of heart. That's, That's right. the great, fathers of the church are real big on purity of heart. And I that takes discipline too. It takes discipline and it takes a commitment to prayer daily. Mm -hmm. I like to say that if you don't come apart, you will fall apart. Uh, most probably. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts uh, for our viewers and listeners in regards to the challenges that remain for the new evangelization? Uh, the challenges remain are always been the challenges from the beginning. We are to love the Lord Jesus. He already loves us. He's done the hard work. Uh, it requires of us a turnaround, a conversion, a purity of heart. Where there is purity of heart though, Friends, I can tell you, uh, Jesus uses us, and it is amazing uh, what he does to allow us to bear fruit and to bear fruit in the world. Thank you, Cardinal DiNardo. You're most welcome. Good to be here. Good. How great it is to have shepherds like Cardinal DiNardo. We'll be right back after this break with Roy Abraham Varghese, who has written about science and religion. Welcome back to Prepare the Way. We will now have an interview with Roy Abraham Varghese, originally from India, who has written about the interplay between science and religion. I think you're going to enjoy this. Roy Abraham Varghese, originally from? India. India, where about India. in India? <laughs> India. I'm from the southern state of Kerala, which is right. on the southwest coast of India. That's terrific. You have developed a number of things in regards to science and that question of can science and faith coexist and faith and God and all that is one that is very pertinent today. You've written some books about that and done some series, haven't you? Thank you, yes. I've uh, helped organize some conferences. I've uh, written and edited books on that uh, subject. I had one book which had contributions for 24 Nobel Prize winners and Time magazine called it the year's most intriguing book about God. What's the title of that book? It's Cosmos, Bios, Theos, uh, Co Universe, Life, God. And I mean, the, my motivation in doing this is that, um, I, I don't know who did it, but there is a popular perception that scientists are inimical, they're against religion or belief in God. 
which is, couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, the great creative minds of science, the fathers of modern science, uh, I mean, Einstein, the quantum physicists, um, they all had a, a, a definite belief in a God and in, in a divine mind. And Einstein even attributed his theory of relativity to divine inspiration. Mm. Heisenberg, uh, famous for quantum physics, Max Planck, uh, Schrodinger, all of these uh, famous, uh, the, the progenitors of modern science had a deep uh, belief, a deep conviction in the existence of a mind behind the laws of nature. So it's not true then that science and God cannot go uh, coexist and go together, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, as I said, these um, gentlemen found in their work uh, pointers in the existence of God. And as in the book with the Nobel Prize winners, this is a number of noted thinkers who through their work in science have been led to believe in a creator. Now, I'm not saying all scientists believe in God, no, but I'm saying the you know fathers of modern science as well as Newton and all the other, you know, the 19th century, Maxwell, all these other scientists, they all had a deep belief in God. So that somehow the idea has crept in that science is uh, opposed to belief in God. It is false. It's wrong. That was the motivation for the books. That's terrific because yeah. that idea has crept in yes. even in Catholic circles. Many times there are Catholics who think they're interested in science and they think, well, maybe I can't pursue it because I'm a believer or because I am interested in science, I will cease being a believer. Yes, and, and it does happen and the reason is this, I think. Um, you know, there's some questions which science can handle and some questions philosophy handles. Uh, when I say philosophy, I mean this is beyond the quantifiable. Science can only deal with what is quantifiable. You know, Measurable. you can measure, mm -hmm. observe, test, physically test. Anything beyond that is beyond the capacity of science. Mm -hmm. Now, some scientists pronounce on matters which are beyond mm -hmm. what's quantifiably measurable, but then they're speaking as philosophers. And Einstein said the man of science is a poor philosopher because they pronounce in areas where they clearly don't have the tools or the background to speak on, but because they have the, you know, um, expertise and uh, reputation in science, people, it's like a baseball star saying this toothpaste is good, you know, something like that. But, but say, so when they comment on these things, people attribute authority to them, which they really don't have. And that's a great point, because we tend to elevate and, 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 and to almost worship scientists because they know everything. But what I hear you saying is, they cannot know everything because some of the questions of life and death and, and existence do not pertain to science per se, but to philosophy and to theology? Yes, and, and immediate experience. So I'll give you some examples. Um, the most fundamental issues, science has no clue to the origin of matter, origin of life, and then I'll, I'll get to life, but I mean, I, those things need a little more elaboration, but three other things which don't need elaboration, which I can show you pretty clearly, that these are beyond science, are consciousness, language, and the self. We are conscious, we are aware. You're conscious of me being here, visually aware. How, that's not, there's no, if you look, cut up the brain, there's no property of consciousness to any of the neurons. Where did that, the capacity of being aware come from? The Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago, suddenly in a span, a very short span, five to 10 million years, conscious beings sprang up, you know, eyes, the, you know, just out of nowhere. Nobody knows how it happened. The atheists avoid the question. A very famous atheist of today, Daniel Dennett said, and then a miracle happened, mm. quote unquote. Um, and so how consciousness, that's just elementary. Beyond consciousness, there's conceptual thought. We're talking, you're decoding, I'm encoding, meaningful sim symbols, language. That's a very conceptual thought, how you can, you know, we have universal, the concept of a dog. Concepts are something nobody knows how it arose. That capacity of conceptual thought came out of nowhere. It just appeared language. Richard Dawkins, who's uh, one of the new atheists, says how language arose is a great mystery. There's no evolutionary for forerunners. So, so they use words like miracle and mystery, so they are acknowledging that they, uh, science cannot prove uh, the existence and therefore cannot prove the non-existence of certain things, well, including God. Yes. Well, but they then do go on to say there's no God for other reasons, but they put these under the rug. They quickly move on. And, and one other famous atheist said, I'm not even going to treat consciousness, because if you get into that, you're lost. And, and I thought, the most obvious is the self. Start with the human self. The I, the scientist who's investigating, what is that? I mean, there's something that unifies all your experiences, your thoughts, your action. There's that center of your consciousness, the I. 
remains the same from the t uh, time of birth to time of death, 80 years, whatever it is. In uh, other words, I am me yes, always. Always. And, and how, if, how do you explain the meanness? Is that and, what you mean by me, the and, I? And where is that I? Yeah, where you, is that every I? cell in your body changes every seven years. The, the brain cells have you know, t tens of thousands of molecules which keep changing. But what is it that remains the same? It's clearly not something physical. Because you know that you were somebody 10 years ago, same thoughts, same, you might forget stuff, but that's another matter. I am forgetting but, quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the eye, you see everything from a first person perspective. You know, the eye, you see, matter does not have first person, person perspective. So when you look at consciousness, thought, and the self, we, all of which are in our immediate experience, everybody knows it, including the atheist, there is no explanation for these phenomena other than at their origin in a source who or with a supreme or infinite consciousness, um, infinite thought, infinite uh, divine mind, as well as a self, a supreme self. Only that could bring it. You can't get it from matter because matter has none of these properties. It's unscientific to say these come from matter because anything scientific has to be quantifiable, testable. You look at matter, it doesn't have the properties of consciousness or language, let alone the self. So, so, so the serious uh, scientists and the, the, the truly open-minded person, when they begin to realize that there are some things that are, cannot be explained by science, is that where then they make that leap, uh, not leap of faith in, they just accept it blindly, but where they begin to realize that there must be this supreme self and this uh, universe, uh, what is it, uh, eternal consciousness? The eternal How mind, infinite eternal mind. Infinite? Um, I would say that any, I wouldn't even say it's not explained, but I think in our immediate experience, we all see this. It's obvious. It's when we are, in a sense, brainwashed away from our immediate insights, things that we know that are obvious, you know, that mind cannot come from uh, a rock. A rock cannot produce a mind given a trillion years. You know, the ability to process symbols and see meaning. That a rock, you know, it, the instant you present it that way, anyone can see that it's not possible. And when you're an atheist, you say, matter has been always, undifferentiated matter has been here forever. And then minds appear. I mean, it's, it's absurd on the face of it. So mm. you have to start off even doing science. It's, science only took off once the scientists accepted there are laws of nature, there's rationality in the universe, and the scientists also rational, so they can find out about these laws. And that assumes there's something transcendent from matter. I mean, the, all the great scientists came, started with a belief in God, which then led them to investigate the laws of nature. It's interesting because, uh, as you referred to at the beginning, uh, that science, this idea has crept in, right? Yes. That science has to prove it all and has the ultimate word. But it almost seems like you were implying that uh, it's the most natural thing to believe because it's kind of in Absolutely. us. The more unnatural thing which is kind of imposed upon us is atheism? You, you hit it on the head. I mean, that's exactly it. It's unnatural and abnormal. And it's always, you know, the vast majority of the human race, every culture, every society, every age has taken it obvious as a, to be natural and normal to believe in a supreme mind because it, it imposes itself on your mind. To deny it is to be in some kind of a straitjacket. In mm -hmm. fact, there's a, a, f a philosopher who's not even a Christian said this is what he calls fundamentalism because you just take it for granted. Fundamentalism. Yes, matter is mm -hmm. everything. And, and you, you don't question that belief. It is that. I mean, I find with all these scientists, you, once you bring consciousness, thought, and the self to their attention, they're helpless. They can't even get into a discussion on it. They've never thought about it. Many of them, I was surprised. Interesting. Now, you have a passion for this. You understand it fully. And, and, yeah, I'm and kind of uh, upset that the obvious truths are being ignored. Yeah, and that people are being actually brainwashed into thinking yeah. that uh, religion and Christianity and belief are wrong when it might be quite the opposite. It is, it is quite the opposite yeah. because these, I mean, if anyone denies this, we question the sanity. You know, yeah. you know, if you deny that you're conscious, if you say I'm not conscious, and, actually, and if you say that you can't think, uh, well, then you shouldn't be speaking, first of all, but <laughs> then you say many, which unfortunately some philosophers say they don't exist. Not only the world doesn't exist, they don't exist. I'm not kidding. They I mean, say this. So they, they actually even become somewhat uh, irrational in, in, yeah, in, in, in their attempt to prove that they're right and not be rational about what There's a thin presented. line between lunacy and some of these. I mean, mm. Nietzsche spent the last 10 years of his life in a lunatic asylum. You, wow. in nihilism, that's where it leads because you're denying the obvious things, you know, and then it becomes hard to live it. Nobody can live 
you know, the athe if you think everything is atoms and so on and there's no rationality. Well, I hope that our viewers, as we close our time together, uh, Roy, I hope they, the, the common person out there gets courage from what they're hearing uh, to, to become more of a believer and not to be pressured into not believing. What are some of the other resources, very quickly, that you have available okay. for people? Well, I'd start off saying, to thine own self be true, is what Shakespeare said. Mm. Be true to your experience. Don't let anyone fool you. Um, uh, I've got, uh, there's a site on one of my books called uh, The Wonder of the World, it's wonderoftheworld.com. Wonderoftheworld.com. Yes, and that explores the interaction, uh, relation between science and these kinds of questions, and, and actually a couple of Nobel Prize winners endorsed that particular book. And, you have uh, two books and a video series? Well, I, you know, I've, I've edited some books, Cosmos, Bios, Theos. I had an, uh, another book with a famous atheist recently. But the wonder of the world really lays out what I'm talking about. Excellent. And then there's this DVD called Has Science Discovered God? In which we have, uh, you know, leading uh, scientists and philosophers discussing these issues, I think, and showing, presenting a paradigm, a model for the origins of life and consciousness and so on which makes sense of all that we see. Because once you have this paradigm, once you see that there's a supreme mind, then you can explain how did life arise? Yeah. How, uh, how did the consciousness come to be? In a mir I mean, otherwise you'd say it's a miracle. That's right. I mean, the atheists will say it's a miracle. How did the self come to be? Language come to be? All of those, if there is a mind that produces it, makes all sense. Well, thank you for your for your for sharing your, your wisdom, and I hope that our viewers uh, go and read up on those resources so they can evangelize better. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much. Thank Roy. you very much. I hope you have enjoyed today's interviews. In order to help you evangelize in this context of religion and science, I'd like to recommend Dinesh D'Souza's book, What's So Great About Christianity, as well as Dr. Scott Hahn's book, Reasons to Believe, How to Explain the Catholic Faith, and Patrick Madrid and Kenneth Hensley's book, The Godless Delusion, a direct response to a major atheist book called The God Delusion. We are called to evangelize. Let's do it well. Let's do it often. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his countenance and grant you his peace.